In this exercise, we have a logistic map, and it's actually the most chaotic logistic map that you can think of because of this factor four here. Now here's a fun formula, which allows you to calculate immediately the nth element of a certain orbit. So try and think how you would prove that this formula holds for all possible values of n. So pause the video and ponder this. Now if we need to show that a certain something is true for all integer values of n, one particular thing you could do in terms of strategy is first showing that it's true for n equal to zero, and then showing that if it's true for n, then it's also true for n plus one. And then combining these two facts will allow you to ladder your way from, one, from zero to one to two, all the way up towards infinity, so, so mathematical induction. So what I suggest you do is try and verify this formula for n equal to zero. I would also suggest you do n equal to one. Why? Well, it's strictly speaking not necessary for mathematical induction, but it's a nice warm-up exercise for the more complicated case going from n to n plus one. So I'll pause the video to give you a chance to do that. Right, let's get started with the case n equal to zero. So we need to show that x zero is actually equal to half minus one half cosine of two to the power zero. So that's just uh, one cosine of arc cosine one minus two x zero. The cosine and the arc cosine, they will annihilate. So we get half minus half one minus two x zero. And then after some grueling algebra, finally we derive that this is equal to x zero, which is indeed what we were after. So we have verified that this formula is true for n equal to zero. As a warm up for the more complicated case, let's now also do n equal to one. So now we need to show that if we apply the formula here for n equal to one, we get x one. So one half minus one half cosine of two to the power one this time. So this will give us two arc cosine one minus two x zero. So now the cosine and the arc cosine can't really immediately annihilate because there's this nasty factor two in front of that. However, we have a formula that you know from kindergarten trigonometry that if we have the cosine of two times alpha, this is one minus the sine squared of alpha. So this seems like a useful thing to, to apply here. So let's see what happens. We still need to show that x1 is equal to half minus one half, and then the cosine of two alpha, we're going to replace that by one minus the sine squared of half the angle. So that's arc cosine one minus two x zero. We can clean this thing up. All of this junk in front uh, just, uh, just cancels. Um, ah, by the way, this should be two, right? Sorry about that. So we have sine squared arc cosine one minus two x zero. The arc cosine and the sine don't cancel immediately. However, it's pretty trivial to make that happen because sine squared is one minus cosine squared cosine of arc cosine one minus two x zero. And this time the cosine and the arc cosine, they cancel. So we get one minus one minus two x zero squared. If we expand this, so one minus one that cancels and then the minus sign also cancels. So we have four x zero minus four x zero squared which is four x zero, one minus x zero, 
which is indeed f of x0 being equal to x1. So we have shown that this formula is also valid for n equal to 1. Okay, um, now that you've seen how this works for the case n equal to 1, perhaps this was the missing inspiration you needed to tackle the case to go from n to n plus 1. So I'll pause the video once more to give you a chance to try this for yourself. Okay, let's tackle the case going from n to n plus 1 in a very similar fashion. So going from n to n plus 1, we need to show that x n plus 1 is equal to half minus 1 half and then the cosine of 2 to the power n plus 1. But this 2 to the power of n plus 1, I'm going to write that as 2 times 2 to the power of n and then we have the arc cosine of 1 minus 2x0. Why on earth am I writing my 2 to the power of n plus 1 as 2 times 2 to the power of n? Because this thing with 2 to the power of n that figures in the formula that we assume is true namely for n equal to n. So here indeed you see at the top this 2 to the power of n r cosine that thing figures there so we're going to assume that this thing on the top is true and therefore it's always nice to be able to fall back on something that you know from that uh, that assumption so this thing here is a familiar side obviously we're going to play the same game as we did before because we have this factor 2 here so we're going to use the formula to go from cosine 2 alpha to reducing the the angle by by 2 so it's going to be half minus one half and then the cosine of two alpha is going to be one minus two times sine squared of the argument. The argument divided by two, so that's two to the power of n arc cosine one minus two x zero. Good, doing similar Clean up as before, that's going to be the sine squared of 2 to the power of n arc cosine 1 minus 2 x 0. And uh, then this is going to be 1 minus the cosine squared of 2 to the power of n arc cosine 1 minus 2 x 0. And here it seems we're stuck a little bit because again cosine and arc cosine can't annihilate their stuff in between uh, but this is where we're going to make use of the assumption that the formula holds for n so if we open a little auxiliary bracket here we know or at least we have assumed that the formula for n holds so we know that xn is equal to half minus one half cosine of two to the power of n r cosine 1 minus 2x0. So we assume that this is true. We can massage this expression a little bit to give us 2x1 minus uh, 1 is equal to minus cosine 2 to the power of n r cosine 1 minus 2x0. Um, we're slowly getting where we need to be because we need to have an expression for 2 to the power of n r cosine which we have here but it's inside this cosine however there's nothing that an r cosine can't fix here so if we bring this thing to the left hand side we can finally write that 2 to the power of n arc cosine 1 minus 2 x 0 is equal to uh, so this there's this minus sign here that we need to apply um, so that gives us 1 minus 2 x n and then we need to undo that cosine here with an r cosine
So finally, we have an expression for this 2 to the power of n, which is just a simple arc cosine, which we will be able to use to cancel with the cosine. So if we go back to what we had up there, we know that we can write this now as 1 minus cosine squared, and then using our new found, new found expression for the argument of the cosine squared, this is going to be uh, arc cosine 1 minus 2xn. Good, uh, we're basically almost finished. Cosine and arc cosine meet each other and annihilate. So we have that this is 1 minus 1 minus 2xn squared. And this becomes 4xn minus 4xn squared. And just like before, it's very easy if you write this like so to see here the f of xn appearing, which indeed is xn plus 1, which is what we needed um, all along. So we have shown that if this formula is valid for n, then it's also valid for n plus 1. Good, uh, that was fun little exercise, lots of things cancelling because of geometrical formulas, that's always nice. Uh, but there's another thing that we can do with this exercise, which is more of a philosophical nature, because you might remember uh, from the course book that chaos basically means the sensitivity to initial conditions. So if you have a certain map and you start from an initial condition x1, and then we keep on applying that map, that if you make, for example, a small numerical rounding error, because your map is sensitive to these small deviations here, um, that basically you will keep on making small deviations, which will keep growing and growing and growing if you keep on applying that, that map many times. So small deviations in the beginning will keep on uh, escalating. Now here, it seems that we have sort of found a, a shortcut uh, because all of the little errors that you make, for example, because of numerical rounding, you can basically skip all of the intermediate steps and go straight to the final result. So you don't need to worry about numerical accuracy for the intermediate steps. So perhaps you have found a way to uh, solve the problem of sensitivity to initial conditions here. Obviously, that's not true, but can you look at this formula and see why this is not a solution to the problem of being sensitive to uh, initial conditions. So pause and think about this. So this formula that we have here, let's go back to that, that formula. Um, it indeed does allow us to immediately calculate xn, but there's a small practical issue, which is not really fundamental, that for very large values of n, this 2 to the power of n will overflow. But the more fundamental issue is indeed that this 2 to the power of n clearly shows you that you amplify small differences in initial conditions, either because of measurement errors or rounding errors, numerics, whatever. Because you see that if you change x0 to x0 plus a certain value of delta, and even if this delta is a very small value, you need to multiply it by this very large factor 2 to the power of n. So this will exponentially become worse, this small deviation here in the initial step. So even though you have a formula to directly calculate xn, you still clearly see that sensitivity to initial conditions is, is present. So this will basically be a very large number. And then if you take the cosine, this final result here could end up anywhere. So even though we have a direct formula, it still is a very sensitive system to uh, initial conditions drift.